Ja, einen äh, wunderschönen äh, guten Abend. Ähm, ich darf Sie herzlich heute Abend hier begrüßen im Orpheum in Graz. Äh, wir haben einen äh, sehr illustren Gast, äh, der heute hier zu uns, zu Ihnen, zu mir sprechen wird. Mein Name ist Sebastian Braunes, ich darf heute ein bisschen durch den Abend führen. Ich freue mich, dass Sie so zahlreich erschienen sind und schon im Großteil Ihre Plätze eingenommen haben. Das Ganze heute am Abend wird sich in einem kurzen Überblick für Sie ungefähr so gestalten. Ich rede jetzt da mit Ihnen, so bis alle da sind und versuche die Zeit ein bisschen zu überbrücken. Und dann begrüße ich den Herrn Schischek, der kommt dann auf die Bühne. Wenn Sie wollen, applaudieren Sie. Und danach spricht der Herr Schischek zu Ihnen. Und ein bisschen auch zu mir. Und danach äh, wird das Ganze ein Gespräch. Und das Schöne an dem Gespräch ist, dass wir hier so ein großes Forum haben. Und dass ähm, es äh, unbedingt äh, wichtig wäre und auch gewollt ist, dass Sie sich dann vielleicht mit der einen oder anderen Frage oder mit der einen oder anderen Ergänzung zu dem, was der Herr Schischek so von sich geben wird, ähm, einmengen. Äh, es ist nur äh, eine weitere Sache wichtig. Ähm, das Ganze endet um 19.30 Uhr. Und äh, es findet danach ein Konzert statt. Deswegen würde ich Sie bitten, geordnet und ruhig, aber rasch, <lacht> den Saal zu verlassen, weil die Sessel, auf denen Sie sitzen, die müssen dann auch noch raus. Und weil die keine Beine haben, oder beziehungsweise die haben vier Beine natürlich, aber die können nicht selber gehen. Die müssen dann von äh, dienstfertigen Helfern und Helferinnen entfernt werden und das dauert ein bisschen und deswegen wäre es gut, wenn wir pünktlich äh, Schluss machen. Ähm, ich werde mich jetzt auch nicht so lange darin erschöpfen, den ähm, Herrn Professor Schischek vorzustellen, weil ich äh, bin fast hundertprozentig überzeugt, dass Sie alle deswegen da sind, weil Sie äh, ihn kennen, sich vielleicht eine andere Meinung zu ihm bilden wollen oder zu dem, was er sagt, beziehungsweise ihn kennenlernen wollen, aber sich ein bisschen informiert haben vorher, zum Beispiel im Internet. Also da gibt es die ärgsten Sachen und, <lacht> ja. und ja. wirklich, ich schwöre, ich bin auch manchmal dort. Also. Und, und deswegen glaube ich, muss ich jetzt nicht ausführlich alle Buchtitel aufzählen, beziehungsweise sagen, an welchen Instituten er Professorenstühle hält und mit welchen markanten und markigen und vielleicht auch kontroversiellen Äußerungen, ja bis jetzt äh, schon aufgefallen ist. Oder dass er ähm, sich sehr viel Kritik gefallen lassen musste, weil er fast kaum seine ähm, eigene These aus sich selbst heraus entwickelt, verteidigt, sondern meistens referenziert. Aber es äh, ist das Feld der Philosophie Gott sei Dank ein weites. Und gerade in Zeiten wie diesen vielleicht auch ähm, wichtig, dass wir auch heute hier gemeinsam den Gedanken einer Kommunikation und eines Forums miteinander hochhalten. Ähm, das Elevit Festival stellt ähm, diese Begegnung hier auch ein bisschen unter den Gedanken der Unlikely Alliances, also zu Deutsch vielleicht der etwas untypischen Allianzen. Und ich hoffe, so eine kann heute hier auch unter möglichster Negation dieser Rampe, die da immer leider auch ein bisschen segregierend ist, äh, zwischen Ihnen und dem, was hier passiert, stattfinden. Ähm, Markig gesprochen wird es wohl um Katastrophen gehen. Das ist ja prinzipiell nichts Schlimmes, ähm, kann man sich auch oft im Internet anschauen, wo es, wie gesagt, die ärgsten Sachen gibt. Und ähm, Sie sind ja auch quasi auf eine gewisse Art und Weise sicher auch der Kit, der uns irgendwie alle zusammenhalten, wo wir zusammenrücken können, wenn wir wollen und gemeinsam was meistern und vielleicht auch was schaffen, was wir alleine gar nicht so schaffen können. Aber auf der anderen Seite beinhalten Sie natürlich auch die Gefahr, dass das Individuum vielleicht ein bisschen äh, zurückstecken muss. Und das ist gerade in Zeiten wie diesen und an einem Tag wie heute vielleicht gar nicht so eine angenehme Sache. Es ist auch irgendwie interessant, dass 90 Jahre in der Vergangenheit von genau heute aus die äh, Erste Republik Österreich sich zum ersten Mal verabschiedet hat und der Ständestaat übernommen, das Parlament hat sich ausgeschaltet. Und jetzt ist es 90 Jahre später und wir haben noch immer Trying Times, vielleicht sogar noch mehr. Liegt vielleicht auch daran, dass wir alle viel besser informiert sind oder vermeintlich besser informiert sind. Also ich freue mich sehr, dass ich jetzt hier auf der Bühne Professor Slavoj Žižek begrüßen darf. Begrüßen Sie ihn mit mir. Bitte. Applaus 
Chaplin does this in, in Great Dictator. He stops the applause. <laughs> Try to... One, two more? No. <laughs> no, okay. No. Okay. Uh, ich muss mich erst entschuldigen. Ich verstehe deutsche Sprache, eventuelle Fragen. Sie können die Fragen natürlich auf Deutsch stellen. Nur, ich kann nicht flüssig Deutsch sprechen. Und eine kleine Kritik an dir. Was habe ich dort gehört? Das bin ich nicht. Herr Professor, Doktor, what did I do to you? Did I rape, did I rape your mother no, no, or what to, to talk? Actually, 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 I did exactly the opposite. I said, I don't want to elaborate on your doctor and professor. Uh, that's so good, I yeah. did other, Because I, 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 pre I prefer this bad taste playing with words. You, you, you are you, brown eyes. I am brown eyes. eyes. I am blue eyes. You are blue eyes. More. Nazi than I really you. Have really. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sorry now, it's serious. Yeah, it's if serious, you allow it's me, I will not try to be too long. Please, if you will feel that some things are provocative, it's on purpose, not to blighting you, not to hurt you, but simply to bring out the real debate. Because I think that in, on both sides, the so-called wokeness, liberal side, and so-called new fundamentalist, rightist debate is less and less possible. So, uh, let me begin. I was so glad to learn that the general title of this event is unholy alliances, <laughs> because this already provides the answer to uh, uh, my title, only a catastrophe or what can save us. Why? Because we live in a time of unholy alliances. I will try, and then we go on a free dialogue, I will try to ground this in, even if it will sound Sometimes funny, it's very sad and serious. Uh, I think today we really live, it's not an empty phrase, in a complex time. Not complex in this empirical sense. Yes, situation is always complex, you know. So, for example, to make a jump towards actual situation, I am basically, of course, in this war, pro-Ukrainian, And I hate me when some of my friends tell me, but you know, Ukrainians are not so good. The situation is very complex. Where? The situation is always complex. World War II. It was not simply democracy against Nazism, because I'm sorry, Stalin was not a Democrat and so on. And we had to join forces. But let me directly bomb you with... Uh, great unholy alliance, which Putin, not only Putin, is exploiting to the end. I know people who know people who are close to Putin. And they told me that what Putin is doing is interesting. On the one hand, he relies on uh, uh, Orthodox Church support the, how do you call it, patriarch or whatever of Orthodox Church in Russia, uh, in Russia, Kirill, he is an old KGB fellow of Putin, no? But not only that, Putin did something very interesting. He hired, hired, okay, controls, a group of young leftist Marxists, and they are the ones who support his otherwise almost openly fascist, conservative line of argumentation. You know, Western Europe is the realm of Satanism. Kirill, patriarch, even proclaimed Putin the greatest exorcist of our time. And, for example, I watched a wonderful debate on Russian TV. I follow it. You learn a lot. There, uh, I mean about ideological madness, when somebody confronts a Putin, pro-Putin figure and says, but are you really sure that Ukrainians are degenerate Nazis? And the guy said, okay, 
even if you abstract, ignore all other things, they allowed a pride parade in Kiev. Like the greatest horror you can imagine. But so what are the Marxists doing? Marxists, they're providing, be careful to it, this other line of argumentation, which is we are fighting for all the third world people against the imperialist, neocolonialist, whatever, Western dominance. And the sad thing is how these two axes, first, anti-gay, LGBT, Western decadence, and the other, like Western imperialism and so on, they get together, which is a catastrophe. That's the first unholy alliance. Check in your newspapers. It happened a day or two ago in, uh, in Uganda. The parliament passed a terrifying law that uh, if you are caught in homosexual relationship, it's not just you are a little bit ostracized. You can even get death penalty, but at least 10 years on, of prison and all that. And uh, then when a Western journalist protect, uh, protested, this happened two days ago, uh, a, 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 a member of Ugandan parliament told him, you are either with us, supporting our anti-gay legislation, or you are with the Western world. You see, this is a terrifying, unholy alliance that you address third world nations, but at the same time playing this uh, sexually conservative, anti-gay rights, anti-LGBT plus, and so on, uh, logic. And uh, so can you imagine for so-called, I hate the term, but I will use it as an abbreviation, for so-called non-binary people, so you use as a general term. Uh, 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 you know what's the bad news that uh, uh, to fight for gay rights and all this is perceived in many countries as part of Western, Western imperialism. I mean, this, this alliance had to be broken somehow. The, uh, uh, now I go to another example of this unholy alliance. It happened, I think, maybe you know more like uh, two weeks ago or three, when there were big pro-freedom, pro-peace demonstrations in Berlin and in Dresden and so on. I mean, I, I almost cried, it's so sad. A part of Die Linke Partei in Deutschland, Sarah Wagenknecht, uh, uh, gave a speech, all this false pacifist stuff, uh, why should we get involved, this is not our war, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know what she got next day? Not ironically, an invitation from a high ranking member of Alternative für Deutschland. But, but you speak like us, like join us, and so on. And this is not a joke. This is now happening in my own country, in Slovenia, in England, in United States, and so on, that the pro-Russian attitude is adopted by extreme left, and extreme right. Why? Well, maybe you know this joke, but what came to my mind is this. I even wrote a book with this in the title, wonderful, uh, simple, but nonetheless, joke by Freud in, from his, uh, from his uh, uh, book on uh, wits, on jokes, where he quotes this joke where you give too many arguments for a thing, but they are mutually exclusive, like the book I wrote against the Iraq war, American 
Attack on Iraq has the title The Broken Iraqi uh, Cup or whatever, no? Like I uh, borrow from you a cup or a vase and I return it to you broken. And you, of course, accuse me. And my answer is A, I never borrowed a vase from you. B, I returned it to you full and C, it was already broken when you <laughs> gave it to me. I noticed that this pro-sympathy for Russia argument has exactly the same structure. Did you notice that there are three arguments? First is generally pacifist. Wars are madness. We shouldn't give arms because, as a general wisdom, if you give arms, you only prolong the conflict. This is, I think, a terrifying notion. Because at the same time, these pacifists claim, but now there is a situation, more or less, uh, how do you call it, stalemate, uh, stable position on front, to push for peace. Yes, but how did we arrive at this position? By supporting Ukraine. Can you imagine what would have happened there without? Uh, and then I draw a comparison for which I got much hatred that I draw a parallel between today's Pisaniks and some crazy communists at the beginning of World War II when on the West they had that phony war who claimed this is imperialist conflict, we should stay neutral and fraternize with German uh, <coughs> with German uh, uh, soldiers, this is not our war, and so on, and so on. So, the first reasoning is this abstract pacifist. I disagree with it, not because I like war, but I think it's absolutely clear that Russia is engaged in a long-term geopolitical rearrangement, and it's clear, not by any sinister hermeneutics, but they say it, the Russian, that they want to go on. Moldova, now they officially claim to have real peace. We have to push the borders of Poland a little bit to the west. We already have Georgia and Gruzia. We already, uh, we already uh, uh, had uh, Crimea and so on. So uh, I think the, that's the paradox I accept that uh, Yes, we shouldn't aim at destroying Russia. That's unacceptable. But uh, Habermas, Jürgen, who we don't like each other personally, <laughs> but he put it very nicely almost a year ago, yeah, where he says we shouldn't speak the language of destroy Russia, but simply negatively, Ukraine must not perish. It's in our interest, especially, again, in view of this more and more crazy, directly male chauvinist ideological foundation, which is Western Europe is the reign of Satan, unholy orgies, and all that, uh, and all that stuff. Uh, now, uh, uh, this, uh, here again, there is unfortunately a moment of truth that the West is still engaged many times in some kind of neo-colonial or post-colonial exploitation. But my answer to this is double. First, do you think that China is any better? I don't know wh what our media report, but do you know that when Chinese buy some resources, m some mines in, uh, I think it was Zambia, Africa. when they bought them, there was a local rebellion because uh, 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 the local workers there wanted a, a, a monthly salary of $200. It was too much. Chinese brought their own starved people who were ready to work for a little bit over $100 per month and so on. So, uh, 
neocolonialism is expanding, but it's, uh, but it's uh, everywhere. Second thing that makes this alliance between left and Putin unholy is, I don't know what's the logic, ah, yes, another thing, sorry, the first argument, we want uh, peace, peace at any price, and usually in my country, in Slovenia, then the, the politicians who follow this line uh, 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 add uh, something very cynical, they say, uh, uh, every war has to end up with negotiations and uh, compromise. And my answer to them is, ah, really? Then we were taught wrong. You remember in 45 there were negotiations and pact with Hitler? <laughs> no, it wasn't. There was a clear defeat. So, uh, so again, this general pacifist stance has to be rejected on behalf of real peace itself. Remember one thing that I repeat all the time. Uh, peace is always in the interest of the occupier. I believe, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm totally pro-Jewish. But on the West Bank, Israel is colonizing it. And when uh, Israel says, we want peace there, I believe them, because peace means they can occupy it in peace, you know. <laughs> of course, even Germans, when they occupied France in 39, were they sincerely for peace? Of course they were, <laughs> because peace means we can occupy it. That's why General de Gaulle, you know what was his great statement which founded resistance? No, the war is not over. France did not capitulate. So I reject this general line. Then the second line of defense is what I already mentioned, the situation is complex. Nobody is clear there. I know, I will not bore you now with it, but I can give you some, once I enumerated them, some 15 to 20 points of mistakes, stupidities committed by Ukrainians. But sorry, this is like condemning and we should. For example, the Allied attack in March 45, I think, on Dresden, which was totally unnecessary militarily, or, for example, the Allied bombing of Hamburg with those terrible storms. Why? Because, as parents of my friends in Hamburg told me, you know what they did, the Allies? They were obsessed with the idea that it's more important to broke the morale of the working class, then to uh, destroy industry, so they focused their bombings on working class suburbs, and they left all the great villas, and so on and so on. But nonetheless, this doesn't change the fact who was right. So often, complexity is an excuse. And the third argument is a vulgar, pragmatic one. It's, uh, it's not our war. Why should we, because of two crazy nations uh, fighting on the uh, edge of Europe, why should we pay more for electricity and so on and so on? I find, again, I find this, uh, 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 this logic uh, terrifying. It's true what my friends are saying, some pro-Russians, that the conflict in Ukraine is a conflict between two visions of the world. But their interpretation is it's Western imperialist vision and authentic multicultural vision of, 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 uh, of coexistence and so on of different modes. I don't like the coexistence that Putin stands for. You know where you get a model of this coexistence? You remember when Taliban took over? They immediately made peace with China. The deal was what? You, Chinese, allow us in Afghanistan to do what we want, to treat women the way we do, but we will not mess with what you are doing with Uyghur Muslims in your country. 
it tells a lot if you look at who are Russia's direct allies today. Uh, Iran, North Korea, and so on, Afghanistan even. It tells you a lot about how, and this is a horrible thing to accept, but yes, world imperialism and so on and so on, but my God, can't we accept that in spite of all the horrors of Western imperialism, what Putin stands for is nonetheless worse. And now I come to, first time I return to my title, Catastrophe Can Save Us. You know that the latest news I got from my friends in Ukraine give a little bit of hope. Ukraine, no doubt, was an extremely corrupted country and so on with all the oligarchs. But do you know that now the left is awakening slowly there? They said, organizing themselves, wait a minute, half, even more of the oligarchs, uh, I don't know if it is here in Austria, for example, many of them came to Slovenia and uh, close to Austrian border, Radenska, a big spa, they simply rented for a month the biggest luxurious hotel and so on. And people in Ukraine are asking, we are doing the fighting, they are doing that. It's under their pressure that Zelensky is now, uh, is now organizing this anti-corruption campaign. He knows that people are not simply fighting. They are raising the crucial question, which is, but what is the Ukraine for which we are fighting? Will it be the same extremely corrupted oligarch system? And that's why I wrote a text for which I was attacked. Maybe, I don't know if it appeared in Germany, uh, with the title, Ukraine between two colonizations. Yes, Russia wants to colonize it. But what do you think the West is doing? Do you know that they have in the South that Chernozium, the black earth, allegedly the most fertile best in the world? But do you know that one third of this best earth in the world is already owned by American uh, 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 agricultural corporations? Do you know that there is all the time pressure also from the West on Ukraine that it should become neo-economically, at least, dependent on the West. My hope is that now, maybe something will come out of it, maybe not, that Ukraine will begin to awaken, you know, to ask the question again, again, not just free Ukraine, but what kind of Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, uh, Another thing, uh, then people tell me, and I come again to this unholy alliances and so on, uh, other people are telling me, but uh, these are just words. Okay, Putin talks against Satanism, uh, world domination, but he really wants just a piece of land there, a little bit. No, sorry, this is a big philosophical even mistake. Ideology, is never just ideology. It has its own power, you pay the price for it. Look at the Nazis. The standard Marx explanation is anti-Semitism was just an, an ersatz for Klassenkampf. Really, they wanted to keep capitalism, Nazis, and so on. Yeah, but the result was nonetheless millions of death and so on. And ideology gets its own efficiency. Like, I don't know why this anecdote stuck so deeply in my mind. When in 44, Germany was withdrawing from Greek islands, they, they noticed that on one island, they left 150 Jews. And in that crazy situation where they needed every soldier, they sent a military boat back to get those Jews. This didn't help them militarily in any way. So again, I don't buy this story, it's really just about material interests. No, 
ideology is to be taken seriously. My next conclusion here, to provoke you a little bit with philosophy. Uh, this is why I am sick and tired of this critique of capitalism, that it's egotist, we care only for our interests. No, the problem of capitalism is, as Walter Benjamin knew, that it's a religious phenomenon, religious in the sense of a radical sacrifice, a true fanatical capitalist. He doesn't enjoy good life. He is ready to work all the time fanatically so that capital reproduces itself. No, we need today more egotism. We need to ask not what about the fate of living on earth, but my God, how will I and my children live in, in 20, 30 years from now if we go on with uh, this destruction of nature? No, we should appeal to good egotism against this false capitalist, uh, false capitalist uh, ethics. Now, the, uh, uh, the next point. Ah, now things get, this was nothing to the provocation, more <laughs> difficult. The next unholy alliance that I see, trigger warning, this will be problematic for some of you, although I am, I cannot say it more, I, I have a whole school of followers among trans people, real trans people, not just that game, you know, now I'm a woman, I feel like a man, and so on, but people who went through all the painful operations and so on, and it's not just change men into a woman, but trying to invent something third, and you know where I agree with them? That LGBT plus, in principle, I totally support it, not just in words. I was engaged in actions and so on. But I don't like this anti-psychoanalytic trend. The commonplace in many of these circles, in Germany, especially in the United States, is, oh, Freud is an old, white, dead man. He still thought in binary terms, Oedipal complex, and so on. No, you know what's my problem? You know this big conflict, especially in United States and uh, uh, United States, between, uh, between, let's call it, biological determinists and LGBT feminists. By, I simplify it to the utmost. Biological determinists claim that sexism, even if sex is confused, you don't know what you are, but basically it's predetermined with your genetic structure or education or whatever, and uh, it's not a matter of free choice. On the opposite hand, you have non-binary, in a wrong way I claim, people who claim people should be allowed to freely choose. It's a matter of choice, how you feel. I claim there is an un unholy alliance here because they both behave as if Freud didn't exist. For an authentic Freudian, of course, sex is, human sexuality is not uh, directly a biological phenomenon. Is how some Grundlage, some foundation is mediated, caught in a totally different uh, logic and it can even be, I have a friend, uh, it, it, it even can be demonstrated with experiments. I have a friend who studies sexuality in apes well-developed apes, gorillas, orangutans, and uh, men, and discovered that apes are much more rational. Sorry for my tasteless way of saying. Let's say you are an, a beautiful ape, <laughs> woman. Actually, I am, I and am. I am an I orangutan. I am an orangutan also. I would like to have sex with you, but I see no way. So, okay, fuck off. I turn attention elsewhere. It's only with humans that you get this type of fixed attachment that the more you are inaccessible to me, the more I'm obsessed. Drawn towards me. Sorry? The, the yeah. more you're drawn yeah. towards me. Yeah, so the whole logic changes. 
Second point of Freud, crucial, and some true LGBT people are well aware of it. You know, sex is not, in this vulgar sense, a matter of free choice. I feel like that. No. To the big revolution of Freud is that, one has to read him properly, that this uh, patriarchal symbolic order, male position, patriarchal, feminine, it's not natural. It's a long and painful process because we have something, we humans, unique. What Freud characterized as childhood uh, infantile sexuality. It's something very strange. Animals, as far as we know, don't have it. Because of the delayed puberty, puberty we have it. This idea that you get caught in crazy fantasies, how are children born? And these fantasies can be very beautiful. Let me tell intimate confession, two of, I clearly remember them, two of fantasies from my own youth. <laughs> when I vaguely knew that sex has to do something with health, sorry, with uh, 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 childbirth. With, with reproduction, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with reproduction, with copulation, but I didn't know exactly how. So one of my infantile theories was, and women liked it very much later, that Sex is long, hard work. You have to F again and again, like you tear to your lover now again, or Angutang and his wife. I tell you, let's uh, screw, let's have sex today. Today we will work on the hands. Yeah, Tomorrow yeah. again on the, on the legs. Okay, you you yeah, have I to do it. I like this fantasy. Until the whole thing until is... Until the yeah. whole body is, yes. And then we may check if we like the hands. And yeah. if we don't like the hands, we, we do, do it, it again. again. We do yeah, it again. Yeah. The second one I have, I hear this story that storks, how do you call them, the stupid birds, are bringing yeah, babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And my dream was this one, that it's better if you want a nice child or a child to do it with open windows. Because <laughs> storks are observing you. And if you make love in a nice way, you get a child, you know. <laughs> now, this is not just a joke. Because the big Freudian theory is not. Then once we become mature, we know how it is. No. All the time to the end, human sexuality is accompanied by fantasies. Freud's big question is not this vulgar psychoanalytic, whatever you are doing, you are always thinking about F, you know, like that. It's on the contrary. But what are you thinking when you are doing F? And here, you Austrians published a wonderful book by my friend. You know, they discovered uh, Wittgenstein's Geheime Tagebücher mm -hmm. from World War I. And he's brutally open. He describes what he's thinking about when he was masturbating. You know what he was? Not gay sex, but uh, discussing with uh, colleagues philosophical questions and so on. <laughs> That's the spirit. So what I want to say, no, but you see what I'm saying. Freud makes it aware that, uh, that uh, human sexuality is a very complex phenomenon. It doesn't emerge naturally, but through a series of traumatic cuts. And in this sense, the process is self-contradictory, uh, mostly unconscious, and so on. So it's not, as some LGBT plus people like to simplify, you know. Okay, I feel that I am that. My point is, how do you know that you really feel this? To Freud, it was clear that feelings cannot be relied on. They often cheat. Elementary, stupid example. You, you, or me, okay, I will not blame you. What if I'm secretly gay, but I don't want to admit to myself, so I enact this as homophobia, <laughs> you know. So, what I'm saying, and again, please, don't buy this cheap stuff. People should be allowed to choose their sexual identity. 
Yes, but it's not as simple as that because it's not simply a conscious choice. It's not that you sit there and think, okay, it would be nice to have a lady, it can be funny with men, but other options, okay, this sounds the best one. No, uh, I will give you an example, which I always like, love. Love is free, otherwise it's not true love. Uh, uh, I cannot tell to you, I will try not to be um, accused that I'm harassing, I tell, I, you, love is not. I compare you, you, and you, and say, okay, you have nice legs, you have nice eyes, you love, like, okay, then I make a list, you are the best, and I will choose you. No, love has the structure of theology, where, as Kierkegaard, my favorite guy, said, <laughs> uh, to choose your religion, it's not that you compare different religions and then follow, like, I compare Buddhism, which is not even a religion, uh, Muslim, Jews, I don't know whom, and I said, my God, Christianity has the best arguments. No, you get the arguments, only you understand the arguments only once you believe, when you already believe. Now you will say, this is religious obscurantism. No, Schott, Marx is saying the same. When he says proletarian position is not, I look around, history, I see, oh, workers will win, so let's join them. No, it's, uh, uh, Marxist truth is a truth which appears only from a subjectively engaged position. So you see what's my point here, that let's all the rights to LGBT+, plus, but really listen to them and to be aware of the, of the complexity. Like, I was now involved, some people attacked me, totally misunderstood me, because uh, uh, into a polemic uh, uh, about so-called puberty blockers. I don't know if you do use them then, but in England they widely use them. The idea is this one. When you are 10, 11, if you are not sure, independently of biological sex, if you are not sure what sex you are, at that point you are not, you cannot decide, but so that you will not be pressured under in the conditions of uh, heterosexual uh, uh, patriarchal domination, they give you puberty blockers which uh, delay, postpone for a couple of years your sexual maturation, with a horrifying for me, totally naive idea that in this couple of years, you will become mature enough to see what you want. Of course, now they are discovering slowly that uh, first these puberty blockers do many problematic things. They disturb the whole process of your uh, 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 biological development, not just sexual identity, but other things, it's very risky. But also I think this idea is totally wrong, namely the idea that with maturity you are free to choose. No, sexual identity is for me like love. I appeal to your, if you were lucky enough to be in love, uh, with men, women, I'm not playing these games, anybody? Uh, uh, you never fall in love, in the sense of, oh, now I decide to fall in love. Be aware of uh, temporality here. You all of a sudden discover that you are already in love. Maybe you even hated, hated, had a problematic relation to that man or woman or whoever, but all of a sudden you become aware, my God, really I'm in love with him or her. That's the structure of love. It, and these are our deepest choices, which are precisely not experienced as simple, free choices. Love or sexual identity is not like going to a patisserie and, oh my God, should I take cheesecake, uh, strawberry cake, or chocolate cake, you know? No, you are chosen in some sense. And the most radically free choices work like that like something imposed on you, but freely 
imposed. Here, again, I think we need today psychoanalysis, uh, we need psychoanalysis more than ever. I'm talking too much, so I will cut it short. No, no. <laughs> Uh, because then you, you, my orangutan, will not like me if I <laughs> talk too much. <laughs> as long as we can later on, you know, like work on the hands. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he is my type, you know. I discovered that behind all his friendliness, deep in him, he can be very evil also. <laughs> and I think this is the whole, the hope today, you know. We were, we were sitting here just like half an hour ago, yeah. and I said, we have a lot of things in common, and yeah, we will come yeah, to yeah. that. You know what I mean And by now this. you are gradually yeah, yeah, coming yeah. out of yourself yeah, yeah. and telling me that I'm telling you what you are telling me, yeah, which that's is a very I, good yeah. thing. No, because, uh, you know, once they asked me what makes a full, if we can talk about this in today's confused time, a full normal human being, I said three things. First, here my metaphysical dedication to some serious cause, socialism, whatever, freedom, ready to work really for it. Point two, some kind of good pragmatism. There are people who are principled but enjoy being principled losers. Many leftists today, they wait for the big revolution. But whenever something happens, Syriza, they say, no, no, that's not yet it, you know. No, let the others do it. Let the others, let the do, others it, do it, yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole history of the left yeah, here, yeah, yeah. how the European left after 68 is just looking. At some point it was Cuba, Vietnam, Venezuela, now we are, no, the revolution takes place elsewhere. We want here to enjoy our academic or what job and see the revolution there, you know. Like, uh, 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 what, I, uh, 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 what I wanted to say is that, let me go on. Uh, okay, I will just cover uh, of these unholy alliances and catastrophe can save us. Okay, another example of catastrophe can save us. Something that uh, uh, worries me very, very much. I cut off that line, I know I said enough about uh, uh, LGBT plus and so on. I wonder if you will agree with this. A very intelligent critique from Bernie Sanders, my God. Good old-fashioned American social democrat. Where are my gloves? Sorry? Where are my gloves? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a complicated yeah, it's metaphor. A compl I, know, I, know, I know, I know, I know. No, no, no. I, know, I, know. I, know. I just no, said no. that he noticed something. You know what's my problem with the a certain time of woke suspicion? That the good old left at least pretended to be unifying. You address the people. You say, we may have differences, but let's say even peace, justice, better health. In, let's get all together. Well, did you notice how the woke logic is, on the contrary, an extremely divisive log logic of suspicion? The first thing they note is, yeah, but the expression that you use there may, may be misunderstood in that way. It's very sad. That's why I think woke logic of this universal suspicion, where are traces of racism and so on, uh, 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 um, uh, blocks solidarity. But let's not get long quickly to the end. Another unholy alliance, what I already hinted at, I think, Zionist anti-Semitism. It's not a joke. We have now, at a very delicate level, a strange alliance between the truly crazy Zionists, those who now want to throw Arabs out of the West Bank, you noticed what happened, I cried, uh, in, in uh, Israel now, that city, for one terrorist act, they want, a minister of finance of them proposed this, to erase the entire city of 7,500 people and so on. They speak openly about uh, annexing and so on. Okay, th there are more problems here, but what I want to say is that did you notice how this radical Zionist Jews who want strong Israel are 
getting gradually into an unholy alliance with even anti-Semitic Western uh, uh, conservatives, for example. If there was somebody who was not really philo-Semitic, it was Donald Trump. He was supported by a series of extreme right, openly anti-Semitic organizations, but he supported Israel. Now you will say, what's my point? Uh, now can, comes a bad surprise. Not now, look into my books, I have a quote. You know who is at the origin of this? Reinhard Heydrich. In he, the one of uh, Van Zee Conference or what. In 36 or 7, he wrote a letter where he said, Jews are an ingenious, active people. We would like to collaborate, trade with them. We just don't want them here. We should help them to move to Palestine and so on. And that's why when uh, Bibi Netanyahu, some six, seven years ago, called French Jews, come to Israel, the right-wing, really anti-Semitic circles celebrated it. Yeah, yeah, you see, go there, go, just out of France, you know. So what, I'm, uh, what, makes, me, what makes me here so, uh, so sad is, uh, is uh, again, this weird alliance. Then people tell me, but Jews suffered so much during the Holocaust. I told them, no, this is an obscenity, what you are saying. Because uh, uh, Arabs are saying the same thing, like some stupid pro-Palestinian, not because he's pro-Palestinian, in Ljubljana, in front of my house, did a graffiti. If I were to live in Gaza, I would also deny Holocaust. Like when you suffer, you... No, this is totally wrong. You know what is for me? I hope we'll agree. The only serious ethical position. The struggle against anti-Semitism, unconditionally. And the struggle for Palestinians, not the terrorists, on the West Bank, should be parts of the same struggle. Point. That's it. That those who manipulate the memory of Holocaust to justify what Israel is today doing on the West Bank, those are the true manipulators with Holocaust. Because they use a mega traumatic event to justify petty colonizing land politics now. You know who? I was asked at, at year 2000 an extremely stupid question. Naive. Elaborate. But, no, no, I will not elaborate too much because then we can take a break, go to sleep, and yeah, then yeah, come okay, again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is for you a and true ethical? Oh my God! Fuck yeah, it. Yeah. Okay, a true ethical hero of 20th century. I said Marek Edelman. This was remember the name, a Polish Jew, absolute hero. He was Bundist there in Poland before World War II, uh, fighting for workers' rights, leftist. He was among the coordinators of the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion. He somehow survived it. He then organized that Warsaw uprising. After the war, he remained there in Poland, although communists wanted to throw him out, with a beautiful argumentation. He said, I see Auschwitz stones there, and I think I don't have anything to say that out of respect for the victims, somebody has to be here to look at those stones. And then, shock, in 67, 8, one of the last things he did is he wrote a message to my Palestinian brothers. He told them, as a Jew who went through all of it, I advise you, resist. Not with terror, but resist, you have the right. This is true ethics. No, that, so that we don't go on, just to conclude, I find the same problem with uh, ecology. You know, that's my philosophical training, you know how often I'm totally, again, pro-ecology. But again, it's complex. One ideology I hate is this uh, deep ecology, which is secretly too anthropocentric. You know, when ecologists talk about, say, 
saving environment. If you read it closely, what they mean is, let's maintain environment such that we can live in it, which means focus on that. It's an arrogant vision that nature in itself is somehow more harmonious, but we, egotists, exploiting people, threw it out of balance. Right. No, the first statement of true ecologism is, sorry for this vulgar statement, you may have heard it, is, if nature is our mother, it's a dirty bitch, this mother. <laughs> a proof. What is our main source of energy today? Oil, coal. Can you even imagine what ecological catastrophes had to happen on Earth before humans emerge that we have all these sources of energy? No, nature already in itself is not some kind of a harmonious cycle. It's, uh, it's destroying itself. So it's not just that we humans screwed it up. Then there are so you know, ecology is for me ambiguous. Again, I'm absolutely for it, for all the measures and so on, radical measures, but don't fall into sim simple ideology. What do I mean by this? Often, my friend Alain Badiou, the French guy, developed this nicely. How today we have a problem of the so-called death of God. There is no authority which is untouchable for us, that if that authority says this, we should call. We relativize everything. And I think often ecology flirts with this kind of uh, unconditionality in the sense that, but we have, can, we have nature which puts limits to us. No, I don't buy this. I think, again, Keep the complexity. What is a real problem today is that it's not only nature that is disappearing, but also we humans as humans. I've written a book about it. Maybe some of you know it. Hegel in, in a wired brain. Well, I tried to pull that. Well, I'm not so much afraid of all this uh, fake stuff, although wonderful things are happening then. Now I will conclude. You know that, for example, did you hear about this uh, face swap hardcore porn? It's done very simply. You take a hardcore shot, and then you just need a couple of photographs of a woman, and you put it in, and then the computer does all the job, and then you have that woman doing all the jazz. You ma can make a hardcore porn with every person that you have enough photos of. A proof, I apologize, I'm open here to you for the tastelessness. I saw one with uh, the German Green Foreign Minister, Annalena Baerbock. <laughs> Fucking like crazy, screaming, it's face swap. Then you can accompany this with uh, we have now such perfect voice imitations, no, that you can completely do it. So maybe, to conclude, we are coming close to something that I almost find attractive. I will conclude with an old joke of mine, which some of you maybe know. Uh, uh, the Guardian Journal asked me some 10 years ago, is romance still alive today? My answer was difficult, but maybe. What would be today the, a really nice romantic sex encounter? A uh, man has his, uh, they call it, it's so vulgar, stamina training unit. In German, you call it even more vagina roar, you call it. A plastic one, it's wonderful. You can regulate the density, how it shakes, you put your penis in. Then, of course, women have this dildo, whatever, plastic penis. Both work on electricity. So let's say you are a woman, I am a man, this time we are not apes, and we want to have sex. Wouldn't you like to do it this way? You come, if you are a woman, with your dildo, I come with my vagina roar, we sit down, we plug them both in, we put a, a, a dildo in vagina roar, 
the machines are buzzing, they're doing it for us. And, and we, we are talking about philosophy, yes. like Wittgenstein. And yes. the good thing is, we can both use the vagina roar, actually. No, no, no. Oh, I yeah, we can. I want to have sex with you if you are a ah, woman. So, okay. So I want the machine, but I yeah, don't want the I effort. Get it. I get so it. So wouldn't this be a wonderful thing today that we do the same thing? We take a really hot couple in a hard pour and just exchange faces and then observe this on screen and have a nice drink and talk and so on and so on. Maybe this is the future of our sexuality. Maybe Thank you very much. I finished. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. You see that? There must be discipline. Before yeah. I hand you the microphone, um, I'd like to like I'd like to follow that thought a little bit with the. It doesn't matter if you see me as an ape or a woman or whatever. Um, I'm not uh, an ape, I'm a pig. Yeah, I'm well, <laughs> thing is, you, you mentioned an interesting thing because nowadays we, we so much relate on technology yeah. and uh, in, a, in, a, in an abbreviation of the popular quote of Nietzsche, the longer you glare into the abyss, the abyss starts to glare into you. Yeah. Um, isn't it like the longer we look into the internet, the internet looks into us as well? So the, uh, uh, do you think that we are already beyond that point where we, you know, started to, speaking about catastrophes, um, that, that's us educating the machinery, the web, everything like mm -hmm. that? Or do you think we already passed the point where the machinery started to educate us? And this is like opening up a whole new field of catastrophes going to happen. This is a very good question because, for a simple dogmatic reason, because it sounds very Lacanian. Lacan, Jacques Lacan developed in detail this idea, which is, I think, very profound, that in order to really look at a thing, in some sense, the thing has to look back at you. And you experience this as the so-called blind spot mm. in the picture, the point when it's looking back at you. And I think uh, it's a speculative thesis, but it can be argued that uh, every sex act almost has, at least uh, at a some deep unconscious level, this idea of voyeurism. When I enjoy sex, I don't enjoy it directly. I imagine being observed by somebody, and so on, and so on. And it's a very good question of yours. What happens with this technology where it's no longer a fantasy, but you are really observed, everything is uh, uh, recorded, and so on. And my quick answer, because I've spoken a little too long, is that maybe what we are losing is precisely this deeper metaphysical look uh, how the other returns the gaze. It's no longer this mysterious X. We simply see where the machine really looks at us, you know. Mm -hmm. That would be my brief answer. That it, uh, it, uh, on the other, my second answer would have been uh, <laughs> that you remember, maybe you do, some Italian guy did something and I didn't like it, I'm sorry, it was supposed to be an endless artificially generated debate between me and uh, Werner Herzog, mm -hmm. which you can listen to it endlessly. Uh, and uh, I had an exchange with you him. You ate the last piece of chocolate, I guess. Yeah, and I told him, my God, uh, uh, listen, couldn't you, like, I'm too fluent there. <laughs> there are none of my dirty tics, none of my vulgarities, and so on. Couldn't you include... Uh, so the real problem with computers imitating us or controlling us is the greatest thing about our human speech, you know who knew this, uh, didn't uh, 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 Kleist, Heinrich von Kleist, wrote a wonderful, a couple of pages, short essay on Iber Einige, I don't know, von Menschen, where his idea is that all great inventions in language, ideas, happened so that you misspoke. 
You say something wrongly, and then you try to save the situation and try to include that. Can computers do this? I'm not so sure. No, me not either, but it's a good thing because as we talk about this failure and these things mm. that happen and then we try to mm. cope with that, brings us back, probably brings us back to the topic of tonight and your re uh, yeah, the title yeah. of your lecture, like catastrophe will save us. Because like in what Kleist says in little in, in language, it's like that a little catastrophe happens and something good comes out of it. Yeah. Isn't it that? Even so today. Yeah. Sorry, so just to finish. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, finish. No, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. That's why it is. many Jewish friends are telling me, you know, this catastrophe now, colonizing the West Bank, direct racism and so on. It's not just hypocrisy when white lib liberal Jews are protesting it, but this was such a shock for the majority of half atheists, what I like about Jews is that, you know, they have the greatest percentage of atheists in the world, the Jews. And it's this wonderful paradox, as a Jew once told me, we don't believe in God, but nonetheless we believe that God gave us the land there. <laughs> that's, but that's so we don't believe in God, but we know that God believes in yeah, us. Yeah. We are the chosen Now you people. said something so profound that I'm just sad that we cannot go on indefinitely, because I think Jacques Lacan says this, uh, the true metaphysical question is not, do we believe in God? Well, some people do, some not, who cares? The problem is, does God, God is our fantasy formation, does God believe in himself? And the answer of all truly profound theologies is no. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the problem, the problem is there. The yeah. problem is there. The problem is that we made him up. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what does he know? Which is why I have another theory. I wonder if you like it. The most, Hit me. Yeah, the most materialist film that I saw, I've written about it, is download it, you get it. <laughs> Rapture. A 25, 30 years old film with, when she was younger, Mimi Rogers. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible story. I will condense it as much as possible. An ordinary, short, short, short. An ordinary girl, uh, okay, is promiscuous, then she falls in love, her husband dies, she has a children, she, and she has an obsession that God will, in a rapture, call her up. So she goes to a desert near Los Angeles, to desert, to desert, to, to wait for God. God doesn't do, do, does nothing. So she kills her daughter, nothing. Then she is arrested for this. Now comes the miracle. Uh, she go, till this point, and is arrested. Till that, this point, the movie is realistic. Could have happened, a disappointed, crazy believer. Then the miracle happens. It's the end of the world. All of a sudden, the walls disintegrate of the prison. She takes a car, she goes to somewhere to the edge of the world where she sees up their paradise. And the ending is incredible. There, uh, uh, from the other side of paradise, her dead husband and daughter approach her and ask her, Mommy, come to us. You just have to say, I love you, God. And she said, no, I will not. After God did what God did to me with all this meaning, no. And then her daughter said, but mommy, you know what this means? You know how long you will stay there? And she says, I know, forever. This is the end. That's, that's the true undermining of religion from within much better than this God doesn't exist. Because when people say God doesn't exist, they usually mean, but nonetheless, it's a noble ideal, you know. Like, I, I talk too much, bitte. No, <laughs> two things. First, this reminds me a little bit in a very abstract way of the story of Lilium from Morna, you know, the play. Uh, Sorry, which the, the, the play? play of Lilium. Are you familiar with that? It's no, I don't. Okay, we we'll talk yeah. about it later yeah. when we work on the hands. Yeah, yeah. And um, the good thing about a film or a movie is that you can make a, like a really hard cut. So we make yeah. a hard cut now because I promised the people that they can ask you questions and we've got another 15 minutes running. Okay. So 
I mean, and I will try to be if yeah, you're stupid yeah. enough to believe me. No, I will try to be. The good thing, the good thing is you're straight to the point. You're not very elaborate. You have straight answers, very short. It's a very good but thing. But you are right in something. I know. The, the I know. great art in books, in films, is the proper cut at the end. Did you see the new Spielberg, and I don't like it very much, Fablemans? Yes. That ending with uh, John Ford is yep. one of the best endings of all the time. And now the fuck get out of my office. Yes. <laughs> bitte. Bitte. You know what song I will sing about you? No. You are, uh, you are uh, Sebastian. No? Yes, yeah. yeah Somebody yeah, yeah, called yeah, yeah, me yeah. Sebastian? Sebastian? Yeah. No, yeah, no, 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 no. Oh. Uh, you know, do you know the old DDR from early 50s? Pro Stalin song, Stalin Freund Genosse. Very That's good. I think about you, Sebastian Freund Genosse. And, okay. and, I, and the song that I will sing for you from yeah. the DDR is Sag mir, wo du stehst. I know, but this is yeah. a pop song. Yeah, it know? was. Yeah, I know. Questions? Bitte. <laughs> I already criticized him. I told him as a true Stalinist. Did you organize the questions? Yes, of course. And they are all censored. Come they on. Are. I so, hope, of course. I hope so, yeah. The nomenclature is watching. <laughs> yeah. Bitte. Sie können, wenn Sie wollen, auch auf Deutsch die Frage stellen. Uh, ja, ich hoffe, das ist okay, sehr geehrter Herr Schischek. Um, ich hätte zwei kurze Fragen, und zwar zur ersten. Um, Sie haben das ja näher ausgeführt, diese unheilige Allianz zwischen Wagenknecht, den Linken und der AfD yeah. etc. Aber wenn man sich die andere Seite anschaut, also ich würde jetzt mal sagen, viele Linksliberale, die sagen, es braucht Waffenlieferungen ohne Ende, die schon diskutieren über eine Flugverbotszone etc. Steckt da nicht auch eine gewisse Ideologie dahinter, dass man den Krieg und den Tod und das Leid als etwas Virtuelles betrachtet? Mhm. Man diskutiert darüber und denkt nicht über die Konsequenzen und auch nicht darüber, dass Russen genauso sterben wie Ukrainer. Und ob da meiner Meinung nach nicht auch ein bisschen diese Struktur der fetischistischen Verleugnung dahinter steckt. Ich weiß, dass da ein Krieg herrscht, aber ich tue so, als ob es diesen ganzen Tod und so nicht geben würde. Und ähm, was Sie dazu sagen. Und meine zweite Frage wäre... Wo sehen Sie die Rolle der Philosophie in den ganzen Krisen? Irgendwie habe ich das Gefühl, jetzt in der Pandemie hat man sehr viel, da gab es nicht viel Platz für Philosophie, eher wurde mit virologischen Grundbegriffen argumentiert und jetzt im Krieg auch sehr viel mit militärischen Begriffen. Jetzt ist er zum Beispiel auch, wie Sie erwähnt haben, Jürgen Habermas ist auch oft angegriffen worden für das, was er geschrieben hat, Alexander Kluge auch. Wo ist da die Rolle der Philosophie im Sinne einer Intervention? Danke. Vielen Dank. Danke. Ich hoffe, dass ich die Frage richtig äh, äh, verstanden habe. The first question. Yes, I totally agree. Again, as I already said, I can give you a whole list of crazy things that Ukrainians were and are doing. But nonetheless, I will tell you one thing. First. I don't buy this argument that it's really a proxy war between United States and Russland and that it's just to support our military industry. Tell this to an Ukrainian and he will explode and justly. He will say, do you think that we are so stupid that we said to ourselves we could have lived in peace But wait a minute, why don't we sacrifice ourselves <laughs> to support the Western military industry? They, for them, it's not a proxy war. They fight for their survival. Russia is openly saying, Ukrainian nation doesn't exist, and so on and so on. I know I didn't really, but what I like very much is this, how you applied to this also, that logic, did I understand you correctly? Ich weiß sehr wohl aber. Because this, I think, is something absolutely crucial that's happening today. This formula, as we well know, is uh, uh, the formula of, again, fetishist disavowal. I know very well, but, but I don't really believe it. I act as if and so on. But today, I plagiarize here my good friend. You should invite her here. I envy and hate her. This means love, because uh, she, she is very bright. I don't want to talk about it, maybe more bright than me. Alenka Zupancic, mm -hmm. my slimming colleague. And she developed that today, it's not just that 
you know something, but at the same time, you don't take it seriously, ignore it. No, it's that the fact is becomes your knowledge itself. I will give you an example. How I claim more and more, we live in an absolutely cynical era where the official ideology situation can only reproduce itself by, in some sense, limited, saying the truth about itself and doing nothing. You know, I will give you, to make it clear what I mean, two examples that I like. First, I hate this Castle Biennale, Venedig Biennale, because I look at the program, they always say, even we are caught in capitalist game, it's all colonial exploitation. Yeah, they say this, but they function perfectly. They're playing this capitalist game. And why can they play it? Because they proclaim it, you know. This is a, a new version of this old Peter Sloterdijk's, his early work, maybe still the best, Critique der Zynischen Vernunft, where he defines it as the vision turning around Marx. Yeah, reflec the, reflection used for yeah, sanctioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know very well what we are doing, but we are nonetheless doing it. The second example is, I really hated it. You remember, it's now two years ago already in Glasgow, I think, that big uh, meeting of Prince Charles was there, every, everybody for fight against global warming. Global warming conference. Right? Yeah, conference. And they were saying all the right things, but it works like, okay, now we said it, now we can go on as usual. So this mechanism, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk too much, but this is absolutely a crucial mechanism which works in different ways. Uh, what you said about uh, crisis pandemic philosophy, I must say that, uh, maybe I speak now in an egotist way for saving my own profession, but in some sense we live in a time when philosophy is needed more than ever. Why? Because in the confusion in which we are today, like in confusion which concerns even everyday people, you know, like Habermas, I don't agree with his solution, but he raised the right question where he said, do we have the right to mix with our brains? Uh, because then we may manipulate our psychic properties and so on and so on. But this is a problem for all of us. I read somewhere, it's a horrible vision, so horrible that I almost like it, that now a guy with some Arab name is opening a big clinic in the Vorort von Berlin, where you will have a perfect reproduction of, not vagina, but how do you call this inside? Uterus. My, uterus, transparent, and you want to have with your wife, partner, a child. You just give sperm and what's the feminine counterpart, and you do nothing. Then you just fill out the form. They give you 200 choices. How to manipulate before even starting the process, uh, sperm and so on, like choice of color, color of the eye, like brown or the black. Blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all that stuff, and intelligence and hate and so on. Hate, I mean, how, not hate. Yeah, hate, yeah. hate, 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 yeah, hate. Yeah, sorry. How and tall, how yeah, tall. Yeah, the yeah. And then they produce the child. And their hope is that, so, you know, all these things, and already, basically, already the abortion debate confronts us with some basic philosophical problems, like what are we as humans, when do we exist as humans? We live in a time of ethical confusion where even everyday decisions re demand from us a kind of spontaneous, basically philosophical, philosophical decision. You know, like the use, again, Habermas was right, but I don't think the solution is right, when he said that when we will be able to do, that's the big task now, to somehow implant vision, knowledge in our mind, either through sleep, hypnosis, or other way without uh, we doing ourselves, 
What does this mean for our whole concept of education? Let's say you are much more honest and bright than me, but I get the proper pills, manipulations, and I can be more efficient than you. What happens with our... Isn't it a wonderful vision that Stanislav Lem already wrote up in the Photorological Congress? That we, yeah. take, we take yeah. pills and yeah. then we, yeah. we virtualize our whole existence? Isn't that happening right now already? Like yeah. we, we, we translate ourselves much more in images than in writing. It's like all the social media, much more like mm -hmm. an image media than yeah. a, a, a written media. No, no, I agree, that's why, but we don't have uh, time, time for yeah. this. That's why I much prefer Lem's novel than Stalker the film. Yeah, me too. Novel is, no, sorry, Solaris already. Solaris, Solaris, Solaris not because Stalker. Because uh, the, the in the film, Tarkovsky does the usual half-religious obscurantism. The object is just a mirror of the deepest desires of our soul, while in Lenz's novel, it became a traumatic external object which simply remains non-transparent. We know they are doing something with us, but we never learn at the end what. What? What? So, uh, 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 just, okay, let's not lose time. What I'm just saying is that precisely philosophy, every great philosophy, always happens in the time of a crisis. Huge For crisis. Sorry? Huge, Huge. crisis. Huge Plato, crisis. Aristotle, it's the end of Polish. It's already the decadence of Polish. And Hegel was quite aware, the new boost of philosophy from Kant to Hegel and later, comes with the problems of Aufklärung and uh, Französische Revolution. When with terror and so on, things went wrong, then the- So we need the crisis. Sorry? We need the crisis. Is to think properly, absolutely. I don't believe that to be a philosopher you need peaceful time, no. True philosophy is for the times of emergency. But can peaceful times, if it's so peaceful and you have no challenge at all, can be a great burden by itself as well? Absolutely. So maybe... I'm afraid of this, absolutely. Yeah, okay. so, so. I mean, I, I, uh, I cannot even... I'm, I'm an absolute workaholic, even tonight, because I was not able to do my work. I go back to Ljubljana... And, and you finish it? Yeah, I, two hours minimum. It's very important to have a regime. Absolutely. It keeps you going, yeah. because you need That's a task in life. I will end with a pure obscenity, but take it friendly. It's not a bad joke. When a German journalist asked me, what's your favorite motto? I said, Arbeit macht frei. And then, of course, I said, I don't mean it in that way, but the Nazis brutally misused it. That work certainly <laughs> didn't make you free. But the horror of the Nazis is that a motto which is, for me at least, in itself a good one, free one. They misused it in the most horrible, imaginable way. But it's always like that. Sovereignty of interpretation means you control how you propagandize for things. Yeah, but, so but that's why I believe in failure, in mistakes, yeah, me in too. misspeaking. That's the only way, even in love, don't you agree that when you declare love, this is for me the most traumatic moment, always. When you declare love to somebody, if you don't do it with some oscillation, stumbling, there is something wrong. It means you are perfectly trained to do it. It's not, did you see a stupid movie? Otherwise I hated it. Four weddings and the funeral. But there is a nice detail that where uh, when Hugh Grant declares love to Andy McDowell, he gets in his typical way, stumbles, repeats himself. That's how you declare love. Yeah, true. So the thing is, we reached the end, unfortunately. I want to ask you one last question. <laughs> with will the, I kill myself? With, with no, no, with the challenge, with the challenge attached to it that you have to yeah. answer it like really shortly. Okay. And we see, and um, if you can like suffice. Thing is, you were talking about the role of philosophy in nowadays times, yeah. and we have very challenging times. So do you generally, like it's more like a yes or no question, yeah. do you generally think that, um, that the biggest challenge is that we live in times where we, um, you know, have 
a lot of reflexes yeah. to counter stuff that is coming to us. Yeah. And especially in times when there is a high pressure of reflex, yeah. that we should take our time to reflect instead of just reflex. Absolutely. This is why, to, forgo to, to annoy many of my leftist friends, the, maybe you know it. This maybe is we my need more no, time no, no. to take this a step. This is my standard answer, like is Marxist thesis 11. Philosophers have only interpreted the world, we have to change it. I claim that it's a correct phrase for today, just we should turn it around. In the 20th century, we wanted to change the world too fast, now we need to interpret it more. Exactly. Never were we so uh, uh, epistemologically, with our knowledge, disoriented. I, I ask you a simple question. What is China today? It's still communism, it's authoritarian capital. The basic orientation is missing. We have to finish now. Ladies and gentlemen, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, danke, dass Sie so aufmerksam zugehört haben. You've chosen, I, 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 ich würde sagen, Genossen und Genossinnen. <lacht> Fertig. Danke. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Stop. Stop. Because with me, you always pay the price. Since you applauded, I will tell you a wonderful, <laughs> dirty joke, which is short. Yeah, yeah. Which is. We have to work on the hands. Hands? You have to go and work on the hands. I don't know. No, yeah, okay. no, 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 but a dirty joke, which is philosophically correct. Uh, a, a nasty wife sends her man in the evening, go out and bring me some cigarettes from the traffic across the street. The husband goes out, the traffic is closed, he goes to a nearby bar to buy the cigarettes, and there is a nice waitress there, they begin to flirt, they end up in her flat, screwing like crazy till three in the morning. Then he said, oh my God, I must go home what will I tell to my wife? And he finds a solution. He says to the lady, do you have some of this, if you do uh, baleen and how do you say, powder? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, bowling, for bowling. Yeah. Okay, he puts this on and goes home. Be careful for the dialectic now. The wife asks him, where were you? Such a long time. And he says, just the, he said, you know, I went out, the traffic was closed, I went to a bar, I flirted with a lady, we fucked like crazy. And you know what's the effect? The wife says, why are you so miserably lying to me? I see the powder, you went bowling with your friends. <laughs> That's the political art, to tell the truth in a way that will confuse the enemy. That should be <laughs> Thank you. Professor Dr. Slavo Shishel. Yeah, we go there. Danke. Danke. <laughs> <laughs> okay.